Stonehenge at sunrise. This ancient ring of stones could well have been used by primitive people as a seasonal clock because here the position of the sun can pinpoint midsummer. So it's a cue for the change to shorter days and heralds the onset of colder weather. For animals living in a temperate climate such as ours, the change in day length is used as a signal to start the breeding season. Most of our mammals produce their offspring in the spring and summer and have a correspondingly short mating season. To achieve this, smaller species, such as these field mice, mate in the spring. Hedgehogs, hares and even horses also mate in the spring, whilst others, such as red deer, sheep and goats, mate in the autumn. By looking at Soe sheep who live on the Isle of St Kilda in the North Atlantic, we'll see how this is achieved. St Kilda has a harsh climate with very severe winter. Lambs born before the spring would perish. Mating time for the soe is over a very short period in the autumn. And what's interesting is how all the sheep become sexually responsive at this time. One of the most predictable indicators of the time of the year is day length. So it may be that these sheep are sensitive to the change from long to short days. Some rather clever experiments are helping us to find out. First, animals need to be kept under controlled conditions, and the soe you see here have been brought from the Isle of St Kilda. Now they're part of an important study into seasonal breeding. It's been carried out by the Medical Research Council on this farm just south of Edinburgh. The soe are ideal for this kind of study. Domestic animals, they do well in captivity, but they're still primitive and haven't been improved by selective breeding. Their behaviour can be closely monitored throughout the year, and as we'll see, there are obvious physical changes particularly noticeable in the ram. What research is doing is to relate these changes to hormone levels and this provides important clues as to how animals get their timing right. We went up to Edinburgh in time for the autumn mating, the rut, and we talked to Dr Gerald Lincoln about the research that they're doing. This year we've kept the ram away from the ewes into the breeding season. Uh, we've marked him up with uh, a coloured mark on his underside so that if he mates with any of the ewes he'll leave a mark on their rump. His behaviour, I presume, will be very intense as we let him into the group of ewes because he's been kept away longer than normal. So we'll get the opportunity now, as he comes into the paddock, to see exactly his response to seeing the ewes for the first time. He's going straight into the group and will attempt to find out if any of the ewes are showing oestrus. Oestrus will be detected by him initially by the smell of the ewe. She emits pheromones at this particular time when she's becoming receptive, and he'll detect these. He will detect them both by licking his lips, tasting the smell as he approaches the ewe, smelling her back end. And he really assesses the smells both from taste and from this strange behavior of Flamen lifting his head in the ear and curling back his upper lip. And what happens is he, he sucks the air and the smell over a special organ in the front of the nose, the Jacobson organ, which is used for really detecting sexual smells. Once he's detected a ewe in oestrus, he will pursue her. And if she is truly in the middle of her receptive period, she will stand for him and he'll be allowed to mount and serve her. In the case of the Soe sheep, they don't form harems. 
the individual rams wander, search out the ewes. And it's very interesting that it's the dominant animals that get most of the mating. And they usually mate with the ewes just once or twice, and then they'll leave them. We don't necessarily have to stay and watch them because he'll mark the ewes as he mounts them with this colored paint and the marks will be left on the rump of the animals. And the exact date of mating will allow us to say when the lambs will be born. 150 days after the mating, which will be next May. And that's the normal time for the Soe sheep living wild on St. Kilda. This is the ram at the peak of the sexual cycle. Lovely shaggy neck mane and uh, a solid neck, swollen at this time of the year by several centimeters under the influence of testosterone. And uh, Nora can turn him over. We can uh, see his testes. Now, the bulk of the testes is uh, made of the seminiferous tubules, so the size tells us really how much sperm he's producing. Um, and at this time, the testes are fully uh, enlarged, as you'd expect, and uh, you can feel the testes through the wall of the scrotum, and here is the epididymis at the base, where the sperm is really stored and very congested at this time of year in the mating season. So this is the, uh, this is, gives us an index of the um, uh, sperm production, and at this time, they're five times bigger in the rut um, than they are in the spring, in the quiescent period. We can actually measure the diameter of the testes as an index of this using a pair of calipers, simply by, in a routine way, um, measuring the diameter across the um, scrotum and the testes. And so this gives us a diameter measurement of 54 millimeters. The other function of the testis is to produce testosterone, the male hormone, and um, uh, we have a nice index, actually, of um, testosterone production in the skin around the um, side of the scrotum, uh, in the inguinal region here, because this goes uh, red in the um, breeding season, particularly before the breeding season and leading into the breeding season. And it seems to be a function as a pheromonal system, the heat of the skin driving off a pheromone for the breeding season. So simply here, we have two indicators then of the reproductive state of the animal. Size of the testis, sperm production, color of the skin for testosterone production. And we tend to use these two parameters to follow the reproductive state of the animals in our experiments. The results of the experiments show an interesting seasonal pattern. If we follow changes in testes diameter from, say, winter right through the year, it shows an annual cycle. A gradual increase in size with a peak during October-November in the rut. This coincides with a decrease in day length in the autumn. Also following the same pattern is the hormone production by the testes, testosterone. Now we know that the development of the testes is largely in response to the release of two other hormones from the pituitary. These are the gonadotrophins, LH and FSH, which in turn are under the control of a releasing hormone from the brain, RH. So we're looking for a relationship between these hormones and day length, and that's exactly what we find. FSH levels fluctuate during the year, and again, there is a peak. It's slightly earlier in the autumn, September, and we'd expect this because FSH starts maturation of the testes. The pattern of LH secretion is different. There are small bursts in secretion, but the highest frequency is in August-September, when it promotes testosterone production. 
So if the ram does use light as a cue, then artificially altering day length should change testosterone, LH and FSH levels. But first, light must have affected RH production in the brain. In order to show that light is the breeding cue in the rams, it's an easy matter to bring animals in from outside and keep them in a shed like this and control the light artificially using a simple time clock. There's no end to the variety of light cycles one can expose the animals to. In the past, we've tended to use a simple uh, lighting regime of alternating four-month periods of long days and short days. A long day is 16 hours light, eight hours dark, and a short day, eight hours light, 16 hours dark. I have in uh, the shed here a group under long days, um, and we can go in and see what effect this has had on their breeding cycle. This animal's under long days, and he's actually fooled into thinking it's um, summertime, even though outside it's the, it's the rut. He's quite quiet, and we would predict he's got low gonadotrophin levels. We can actually measure these by uh, collecting blood samples from the jugular vein. What we find is that under long days, both LH and FSH levels in the blood are low. Under short days, if this animal is under short days, the LH and FSH levels would actually be high. This is the cause for the changes in the testis. Perhaps the most interesting thing that we can show is that gonadotrophin secretion is episodic. So it's clear what's happening to the ram during the year under natural conditions. There's a clearly defined seasonal cycle in the size of the testes, small in spring and large in autumn. In spring, the secretion of RH, LH, FSH and testosterone is low and the testes are regressed. On an hourly scale, there are few or no RH pulses from the brain. In the summer, the secretion of RH increases, stimulating the reproductive axis. LH pulses are now clearly evident, reflecting the resumption of RH pulses at a frequency of three or four per day. At this stage, each LH pulse causes only a small increase in the secretion of testosterone, since the Leydig cells in the testes, which produce testosterone, are still relatively inactive. In the autumn, the secretion of RH is at a maximum. At this time, LH pulses occur every one to two hours, reflecting the high frequency of RH pulses from the brain. Each LH pulse now causes a large increase of testosterone as the testes become fully functional. The high testosterone levels stimulate sexual and aggressive behavior, characteristic of the rutting season. RH also induces FSH secretion, which acts, along with testosterone, to support full spermatogenesis in the testes. Thus, the ram becomes fully fertile for the mating season. In a microscope section through the testes in spring, we see small seminiferous tubules and the sperm cells are underdeveloped. In autumn, the tubules are large and cells are organized around a central cavity into which sperm are released. In the same way, the female reproductive tract develops in late summer and autumn. Dr. Ian Wilmot. This is the tract of a female sheep that has not yet come into season. The whole tract is very small, being less than 10 centimeters long. We can see the cervix at the cut end, the uterine horn, and the ovary. The uterine horns are pale and rather flaccid, and similarly, the ovary is very pale, and the only structures that you can see are the small graphene follicles, some one or two millimeters in diameter. If these follicles are examined on a light microscope section, you can see several different layers of cells, a small cavity, which is known as the antrum, and projecting into that small cavity, you can see the oocyte, which is still immature, surrounded by follicular cells. These follicles, under the influence of the gonadotrophic hormones from the pituitary, are going to grow and produce the oestrogen, which is necessary for the growth of the reproductive tract, and which will induce the ewe 
to show mating behavior. I have here the tract of a ewe that has just come into season. While all of the ewes come into heat during autumn, there is a spread of three or four weeks in the occurrence of the first heat because of individual variation in the response to the changes in light. And the whole tract is very much larger. The uterine horns are longer, but very much wider, much thicker. There's been growth of the uterine tissue. And on the left ovary, you can see the large follicle which has been responsible for some of these changes. If a follicle like this is examined on a light microscope, you would see a very large antrum. And projecting into that cavity would be the oocyte, which is now undergoing maturation. If this follicle had been left, it would probably have ovulated within 24 hours or so. And over here, I have the tract of a U that ovulated about a week ago. And the tract has been dissected so that you can see the oviduct. At the time of ovulation, the egg is shed from the follicle into the top of the oviduct. And the follicular cells remain and grow to form the corpus luteum, which synthesizes the progesterone, which is so important for the establishment of pregnancy. The egg, which is released into the top of the oviduct, is speedily moved down into this wider part of the oviduct called the ampulla, where fertilization takes place. At this time, it's unable to move down into the lower regions of the oviduct because this region is contracted. After some three or four days, the corpus luteum produces progesterone, which makes the lower region relax, and so allows the egg to pass through the oviduct and down into the womb. It's here that implantation will occur and the pregnancy developed through for the remaining five months. If fertilization has not occurred, the uterine horns will produce prostaglandin F2 alpha, which will cause regression of the corpus luteum and then give the chance for the smaller follicles in the ovary to grow and to bring the ewe back into heat. And this is very important because while 75% or so of the ewes do conceive to first mating, some do not. And it's very important to her that she should be able to mate again in order to increase the chance that she will ultimately lamb. The interval between the successive heats will be about 17 days, and this is the length of the estrus cycle. And it's the superimposition of the estrus cycle on the annual cycle which makes research in the female more difficult. By contrast, in the male, there is a continuous gradation of reproductive performance so that there is variation in sperm production or in behavior which can be studied. And it's possible to analyze the effects of the environment on these characteristics. Whereas the female is either cycling or not cycling. And it's very difficult to study the events which occur during the change from the breeding season into the non-breeding season. In studying the mating behavior of the psoe, it's quite reasonable to use the ram as a model because the same hormones are operating in both sexes. And since light seems to be a major breeding cue for the ram, then it's almost certain to be true for the female. Gerald Lincoln. The interesting question is, how do seasonal breeding animals measure changes in day length, the changes that regulate the timing of the annual breeding cycle? The evidence points, for the sheep at least, to the eye as being the um, photoreceptor, the primary means by which light influences the brain. Now, in front of me, I have two skulls. Uh, this is uh, the skull of, or half the skull of, a ewe, a so a ewe. Quite a lightweight skull. And in contrast, here we have the a much more solid skull, a soy ram. And we can look at the bits of the head involved in the photoperiodic response. You can, in fact, see on this skull where the optic nerve comes through, feeding into the brain, coming from the eyes. And that will carry the light information about the change in day length. On the bottom of the brain, this is the brain recess, of course, is the pituitary gland, and it sits in this little bony recess on its own. And this is the gland that secretes the gonadotrophins that control the reproductive system in both sexes. And the question we need to ask and try and unravel by experiment is how does the brain in here regulate the activity of the pituitary which can, governs the activity of the testis. 
I have in front of me, down here, um, the brains of two sheep taken from the slaughterhouse today. This one is turned to show the underside. And you can see here the optic nerves cut as the brain was taken from the skull. Behind the optic nerve is the base of the hypothalamus and in the centre the stalk of the pituitary gland which joins the hypothalamus to the pituitary. Now the other interesting area in the brain is shown here on the top side. Here is the pineal gland in between the two cerebral hemispheres. We know that if we disrupt the uh, pineal by removing it or disrupting its innervation that this knocks out the photoperiodic response. The animals can no longer time their breeding cycle. The principal hormone secreted by the pineal gland is melatonin, an indole. And we have measured melatonin in the soy sheep and find that its pattern of secretion very much reflects the pattern of day and night. Melatonin is secreted largely at night, throughout the night, and not during the day. So there's a 24-hour pattern in melatonin secretion. It runs in phase with day and night, with melatonin being secreted during the dark period. But if melatonin is the controlling factor, what characteristic of the daily profile is important in relaying the effect of day length? If we look at melatonin secretion during 24 hours in spring or summer, we find a short period of melatonin secretion corresponding to the short nights. In the autumn or winter, the period of secretion is several hours longer, associated with the longer nights. Experimental evidence indicates that it is the change in duration of the melatonin peak which activates the photoperiodic response. The brain is provided with a signal for night length rather than day length. So now we must link the activity of the pineal gland with the control of reproduction. It appears that it's the change in the duration of the melatonin signal which causes the change in RH secretion from the brain. This in turn dictates the release of LH and FSH, which we've seen dictates the cycle of fertility and mating behavior. These SOA lambs have a good chance of surviving since they were conceived at a specific time in the autumn and hence born in the spring.